So uh, we are now ready to start the next talk. So I'd like to invite uh, Alan uh, Zender from uh, Cornell, uh, Sibley School of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, formerly, he was in the theoretical and applied mechanics, which has merged with mechanical engineering. So Alan is going to talk to us on deformation and fracture of dual cross-link hydrogels. Alan, uh, the talk, uh, after 45 minutes, uh, we will take a five minute question and answer session. So you'll have 45 minutes for the talk. I'll alert you about three minutes before that. Okay. Uh, and to the audience, if you have any questions, please post it on Q&A. And, &A. and uh, based on the time available at the end, I will uh, uh, choose your question to be posed to Professor Zender. Alan, you are on. Over to you. Great. Well, thanks for the invitation. And uh, congratulations to Professor Simha on your retirement. And, you know, this uh, COVID situation is pretty awful, but uh, it's given us kind of a unique opportunity to get together by Zoom and hear the voices of my friends and colleagues that I haven't seen for quite a while. So it's really... Alan, you have to share your screen. Your PowerPoint hello. is not on. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, but I just wanted to say hello to everybody. And right. let me share the PowerPoint here. Um, hold on. Just going to do a little housekeeping here. Uh, okay, we, so 40, yeah, we can see it. Yeah, we can see yeah, it. Yeah, understood. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I think the title I have here may or may not be the same as what I uh, showed you. But in any case, this is work that I've done with my colleague, Professor Hoy. And our, there's two students here, Ming Kong and Jing Yi. They both graduated. Ming Kong is working nearby at Corning. He's moved on to work on glass instead of the soft materials. And Jing Yi is at 3M up in uh, Minneapolis. And we've worked with our uh, colleagues at ESPCI, the group of Constantino Kratan. And uh, this is a little bit of a catch-all talk from work that we have done about up to about a year ago on the deformation, the time temperature superposition, and the fracture mechanics. So I may skip a little bit of it in the interest of time, but we'll see how it goes. So I'll just start with what are we talking about here when we talk about a hydrogel. And uh, hydrogel basically is a polymer network swollen with water. So edible example is jello. Honestly, I don't really like eating jello, but it's a good example. And jello is very squishy and stretchable. Jello is actually pretty brittle. It won't really stretch very much before it breaks. And a lot of the effort that we're taking here, it's around finding hydrogels that can stretch a lot, absorb a lot of energy, and be resistant to failure. So you could use them in some load bearing applications. Right now, um, the ideas around the uh, desirable mechanical properties of hydrogels is to get them to be very tough. So an example on the left is from Professor Gong's group where she's slicing into a piece of gel and you can see it deforming like crazy before it fails. And then also the possibility of gels that can self heal. So what you see on the right hand side is one gel that's dyed blue and then you cut it, you put it together with the other pieces that are dyed in that amber color, and there's enough diffusion, because it's mostly water, it's like 90% water, enough diffusion uh, of the polymer chains that the um, that cut surface can self-heal, and you can go back and stretch it out quite a bit. Maybe not 100% strength recovery, but quite a bit of strength recovery. So those are properties that we're looking for in the gel that we'll be working with. And uh, right now, Basically, the applications are for non kind of load bearing situations, diapers, contact lenses, bandages, and things like that. But could you use hydrogels in some type of substrate for flexible electronic or microfluidic systems? Could you have artificial cartilage made of hydrogels? All these applications require the gel to hold up under under load, basically. Think about it just from a structural engineering point of view. If you want to design something that can carry a load, you need to know how to model it. So what are its deformation characteristics? How can you predict its fracture? Uh, can you make a computational model uh, with of this material in a certain structural configuration and loading and predict what's going on? So those are the kind of things that we're working on. So at a high level, we want to understand the mechanics of deformation and failure, relate those to the underlying bonding dynamics. Um, and so we'll do that in the context of a PVA dual crossing gel. And I'll explain what I mean by dual crossing gel. 
And then we'll talk about the stress strain behavior, experiments, modeling. I won't talk about the finite element implementation of that, but we do have a FEM implementation of this, which we've written as a user material in Abacus. What are the effects of temperature and what is one approach to predicting fracture in this particular gel? So this gel uh, is based on polyvinyl alcohol um, as the polymer and the sort of green and red dots there are a cartoon to denote permanent uh, cross-links or chemical cross-links as they're called, basically covalent bonds between the uh, chains. And transient cross-links, or also called physical, effectively ionic cross-links between the chains. And the idea, I think it's in the next slide, maybe by the next slide. Um, let me come back, sorry, this is a little out of order. This gel is mostly water and uh, it's very stretchable, it's very viscoelastic. And I guess I don't really have the slide in here. The idea here is that um, the transient bonds can break and reform, and that's going to lend a certain viscoelasticity to the material, uh, which you'll see coming up. Okay, so let's talk about the constricted model and the experiments. And when I talk about the constricted model, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more how this bond breaking and reforming leads to the mechanical properties that you see. But let's just start, I'm an experimentalist, so let's start with the experiment. It's a very simple experiment to understand the deformation of this. Basically, there's a strip of material which is clamped top and bottom. It's loaded in tension. It's a very low capacity load cell. To keep the gel from drying, the experiments are performed immersed in mineral oil. So that's why you see this tank on the left. Uh, the loading system is basically just a stepper motor driving a translation stage. The loads we're talking about are sub-Newton loads. They're very, very low loads. This gel is quite soft. And the load, in fact, is so low that the buoyancy itself of the mineral oil has to be taken into account in the calibration of the load. Uh, so one thing which you hadn't expected. And if you um, look at the data, typical data look like this. So what I'm showing on the right, the stretch ratio you think of that as one plus the nominal strain. So one means undeformed. The nominal stress is just force divided by the original cross-sectional area. And each color represents a different rate of loading. So the blue curve is a stretch rate of 0.1 per second, and the dashed blue curve is a stretch rate of 10 to the minus 3. So it's two orders of magnitude difference in the stretching rate. And you can see, as you would expect in any viscoelastic material, the faster you stretch it, then the stiffer it effectively behaves. And when you unload, it will have quite a bit of hysteresis, so it does not unload on the same curve that you uh, loaded it on. And you'll see that actually the stress becomes negative. What happens when you unload it is a sample will slightly buckle. That's why the stress is negative. And if you wait over time, that stress will creep back up to zero stress and you can repeat the experiment. The gel has a certain degree of self-healing. So on the left, if you do a test, you load it and you unload it with a short rest in between, you see the second loading cycle has a lower stress than the first loading cycle. But if you wait long enough, you wait five minutes uh, between the cycles, then it will completely recover. So the second loading cycle looks exactly like the first loading cycle. So basically all of the bonds that had broken during the, during the test are able to reform and the material is basically good as new. It doesn't mean you can tear the gel in two and have it come back into one piece, but it, if you don't fail the covalent bonds, the permanent bonds, then the material can recover fully, at least as best we can tell, up to, at least up to these stretches. The uh, physical hypothesis underlying the constricted model is what I just said, is that the physical crossings can break and they're going to reattach with a time scale, which we call T sub B. And we'll see that that time scale will be temperature dependent. It'll be faster at higher temperatures. And in our model, that process does not depend on stress. So in terms of viscoelasticity, it's basically a linear viscoelastic model. It's independent of the stress. And the interesting thing about this is that after a bond breaks and it will release its energy, it will later uh, reform 
uh, at a time tau, and the only energy now that accumulates is from the current time t to the time that it had reattached, which is called tau. So we're going to see a kind of convolution integral term in the constrictive behavior that reflects that uh, breaking of chains and then reforming at a later time tau. Okay, so I'll go through the constrictive model just in terms of the um, overall picture here. So it has two pieces. The part on the left is basically just an elastic model, um, you know, hook-in model, in which the modulus uh, depends on, the, the modulus has a term which is mu times rho, that part never changes, that's the fraction of chemical crossings. N of t is the fraction of chemical, physical crossings that have survived from time zero up to the current time. And that N of t evolves and I'll show you the evolution of that. And the rest is just the usual um, stretch terms that you would have. This is for 1D. This is in terms of the um, true stress. And then you have a term which corresponds to the breaking and reforming of bonds, which is in the dashed box there. And here you are going to calculate the uh, uh, V sub B is basically the fraction of crossings formed at time tau and attached to time t greater than tau. And so you integrate that up to the current time with respect to tau, where tau is the time that the bonds have reformed. And in this complicated model, there are four material parameters. Mu rho is basically the stiffness. It's the long time modulus of the material effectively. Uh, mu gamma bar infinity is a kind of a rate of reforming of bonds. Alpha B is a term which corresponds to the breaking function. And TB is a, basically a characteristic time associated with the um, breaking of the bonds. So when we do our constitutive modeling and fitting, we're going to be matching those parameters to the, to the data. And I'll show you one approach to that. And we've actually developed some uh, more sophisticated approaches in the meantime, but they're not quite ready for prime time. But you can do a stress relaxation test where you just stretch it to a certain stretch and you hold it. And in that case, the um, only part that you have is the first term of the model. We take the long time modulus to be the mu rho, and then we fit the other data to the relaxation test. And then we iterate these parameters to get a fit to the um, loading and unloading test. And I'll just give you an example of the fit at two different stretch rates. The red is the model, the black is the experimental data. The model doesn't consider the buckling of the sample, that's why it goes into compression. But at least up to a stretch of 1.3, we're able to model that data extremely well with this constitutive law. So we're pretty confident about this in terms of its ability to describe the deformation of the material. And now we have the question of what happens if you increase the temperature. We expect, of course, all of the breaking to speed up, the bond reform formation to speed up again. And we did a couple things. We did experiments where we, in our tension test setup, we also did temp usual torsional rheology tests at very small strain to see what's going on. So I'll just briefly mention that the experimental setup to do the loading at different temperatures and stretch rates is shown here. We do it in the oil. We basically have a thermocouple on the grips to control the temperature. We have heaters which are uh, which are have a feedback control to the temperature of the oil. I'm oh, sorry, we have a temperature sensor in the oil, not on the grips. Uh, we have to circulate the oil a little bit, otherwise it segregates. You will have the hot oil coming to the top and we won't get a uniform temperature. Anyway, we're able to hold the temperature within about half a degree with this. There's a little bit of extra noise associated with circulating the oil, but uh, we're able to overcome that by just a really slow circulation. The data are shown here. On the left, we are holding the temperature constant. So I did mention to get the low temperature, we actually refrigerate the oil and then we just pour it in and we do the test fast enough that it doesn't cool off or we can add a little more cold oil if we need to. So a low temperature, again, you see the high stretch rate, the sample behaves more stiffly. And on the right hand side, 
is the same stretch rate, but for different temperatures. So the lowest temperature is the stiffest. You can see a little bit of noise in the data there. Uh, that's really coming from the circulation of the oil, a little bit of electrical noise as well. We just smooth that out when we deal with the data. So how we model this is we fit our constitutive model to each of these temperatures, and then we're going to look at the trends of those parameters with respect to temperature. So oops, what we see is that the alpha B term, which is a kind of a, uh, it's the breaking rate uh, power law, essentially, that's pretty constant. The mu rho is effectively the equilibrium modulus of the material that is also pretty much constant with respect to temperature. But what changes is mu, gamma bar, infinity, and TB. Those are the terms that have to do with the rate of reforming and the rate of bond breaking. So as it gets hotter, the time associated with bond breaking gets faster, the rate associated with bond formation uh, speeds up. So one of those numbers is going up, the other one is going down. One is a rate and the other is a time, essentially. And um, if we just look at how those data fit the, uh, sorry, how those model uh, fitting fit the data, you see it works really well over the whole range of temperatures and strain rates. The solid curves of the model and the dots are the experimental data. And we're also interested in how this relates to small strain torsional rheometry. In the torsional rheometry, you just take a disk, you put it under cyclic torsion, and you um, give it, in our case, we took a fixed strain amplitude of 0.3%, and we vary the frequency from 0.1 to 10 hertz, and the temperature from 13 to 50 degrees. And from this, you're going to get the dynamic modulus, the, the uh, complex modulus, the storage modulus, and the loss modulus. And just uh, to remind you, if you apply a cyclic shear strain, you get a cyclic shear stress that is going to be phase lag with respect to the strain. You can resolve that into the G prime term, which is in phase, and the G double prime term, which is out of phase. The G prime is the storage modulus, G double prime, the loss modulus. And those will depend on frequency and temperature. And the idea of the time temperature superposition is that you shift the time or the frequency by a factor a sub t and you can shift the storage modulus by a vertical shift uh, b sub t. So one is ch changing the rate at which everything occurs and the other is a kind of a scaling of the modulus. And we expect both of those to be temperature dependent. And the question that we wanted to address is whether what we get from our tension tests in terms of the shifts is consistent with the um, constrictive model that we have and the tension uh, uh, loading unloading data. So just really quickly, the raw data for the rheometry test are shown on the left. The 10 delta is the ratio of the storage to, sorry, the loss to storage modulus at different temperatures. You can shift that to get a master curve and that shift will tell you the horizontal shift factor. And then you, once you apply that horizontal shift factor, you can uh, vertically shift the storage modulus, and that'll give you the B sub T term. So the raw data on the left and the shifted data on the right. And then you can double check that all this works by applying the vertical and the horizontal shift to the storage modulus, sorry, to the loss modulus. The raw data for the loss modulus is on the left, and the raw data, the shifted data for the loss modulus is on the right. So just to suffice it to say that this TTS superposition works well for this gel. And uh, you, know, you can apply the usual shifts to collapse the data onto a master curve. And if we calculate the shifts from the, um, uh, that we would get based on our constitutive model, we get the following. So the equations on the left middle there, that is the calculated storage and loss modulus based on our constitutive model, uh, solving the problem of the torsional rheometry. And you see in here that the frequencies all scale with omega TB. So basically the change in the TB, which is the rate of bond breaking, that gives you the, the uh, vertical, the horizontal shift. And the uh, vertical shift will come basically from the uh, mu gamma bar infinity term. 
And if we compare the uh, shift factor we get from our tension data, that's the first arrow there, and the shift data, the, the horizontal shift we get from the rheology, you see they're very close. So we feel that this constitutive model is consistent with the rheology data and does a reasonably accurate job of describing the uh, horizontal shift that we get. And if we look at the uh, horizontal shift factor on a log scale, we can match it up pretty well with, uh, with an Arrhenius model, which we expect. Uh, maybe not quite so good at the right-hand extreme there, but basically uh, shift that we get from the neurology is from the tension test is fairly consistent with this Arrhenius uh, fitting. So just to wrap up the uh, that viscoelastic TTS stuff, it uh, looks like we do a pretty good job of describing this uh, over a range of temperatures and strain rates. And it's interesting, even though the material has got all this bond breaking and everything, basically simple viscoelastic, linear viscoelastic rules still apply, even though we have large deformation um, of the material and um, it's not you know, linear from that point of view. All right, and then the third part of the talk here, uh, we're just going to shift to the fracture testing. Since my background is fracture mechanics, I always want to see if we can break things. And we kind of do two things. We want, we're going to use computational analysis to help us to uh, understand our experiments and extract some fracture uh, criteria and parameters from the experiments. So we first of all want to make sure that we can accurately crack, uh, calculate the crack tip fields. And then we're going to use those calculations to infer failure conditions for the gels. And we're going to show experiments where we've done relaxation tests uh, with a cracked sample, and then constant loading rate test to failure. And then we're going to do um, creep rupture experiments where we hold a fixed uh, stress and we look at the time to failure for different uh, stress levels. So first of all, let's just test our ability to actually uh, calculate the crack tip fields. And we do this in a couple of ways. We do this by comparing directly with experiments, and we also do it by comparing with asymptotic analysis. So one of the experimental checks is very simple. We take an edge dot sample, uh, we, we load it, and we're going to measure the shape of the uh, open sample of the crack, basically. And then we simulate that experiment using the constrictive model that I described previously, but implemented at a plain stress uh, user material in Abacus. And so we're going to compare the crack opening from the experiments to the crack opening from the FEM. And these are not um, scaled or anything. These are, the, you know, we didn't like Fudgy's data, but what you're seeing, the yellow lines are the predicted crack opening and the, uh, it's a little bit hard to see there, but the gray is a, just a photograph of the sample. The nominal stretch ratio is just the delta L over L ignoring the cracks. So the actual crack tip stretches, of course, are higher. But we see, at least in the overall behavior, a very good agreement between the uh, calculated and measured shape of the crack. So that's one evidence we have, let's say, that our computational analysis is working well doesn't tell us maybe the cracked up stresses are exactly right, but at least we get the overall shape. So a second test is to compare the stresses. Um, I won't show the details, but it turns out that in this material, as you get close to the crack tip, basically it looks like a neo-hookian material with a, a time-dependent modulus. And in that, the nominal opening stress basically looks as if it was linear elastic. That is, it has something which is like a stress intensity factor, and it scales like 1 over the square root of the distance. That r is the um, distance in the undeformed coordinates. And so we then calculated the stress at the crack tip uh, with very fine meshes and compared that to the asymptotic shape there. And so you see all of the um, dots are the computational results, the dashed lines are the asymptotic results, and it's on a log-log scale with a slope of uh, minus a half, so that 
shows it very close to the crack tip. I mean, very, very close within less than a tenth of a millimeter out of a sample with a crack length of four millimeters, we're able to capture the asymptotic crack tip field. So that's another evidence that we're able to ca accurately calculate the crack tip fields. And then the last sort of verification that we did is we looked at the crack tip strains using digital image correlation and comparing the uh, strain from DIC to the strain that we measured uh, or that we calculated from the computational analysis. So I'll just skip over DIC and go to the results. On the left is the vertical strain field uh, mapped onto the unloaded configuration. And on the right, we just take a line from the crack tip going uh, to the left and we plot the uh, strain uh, head of the crack from the computational analysis, the blue curve, and from our DIC, which are the red dots. And the inset just shows the first two millimeters of that. So up to, up to a tenth of a millimeter or so, we get good agreement between the uh, computational analysis and the DIC. And we're basically not able to go uh, any closer with the DIC analysis than that tenth of a millimeter. So at least up to that level, we have uh, some confidence that we're able to accurately compute the crack tip fields. Okay, so what do we do with that? Is we uh, are going to do a couple of experiments. So one is gonna be a creep fracture experiment. So we're gonna hold the um, stress at a fixed value and the sample will creep. And you see the nominal stretch versus time for stress of 3.4 kPa on the left. And those curves end when the sample breaks. So that's why they end there. And if we plot the time to failure versus the nominal stress uh, on a semi-log scale, you see they'll line up basically with a straight line, lots and lots of scatter, which you see in all other experimental data of this creep rupture sort. And you see what you would expect, the higher the stress, then the shorter the time to failure uh, occurs. So it suggests a kind of a kinetic uh, failure approach. And we model that by I'll just uh, skip on here. We model that with the kinetic model of failure, which is shown here. So N now is a kind of a damage parameter. It's not the uh, number of bonds as it was before. And uh, you start at zero. And when N gets to one, you say it's broken. So it's basically like a damage accumulation model. The breaking rate is exponential with the stress sigma. And it's over the temperature and the Boltzmann constant. Well, you have a singular stress, so what the heck do you use for this singular stress field with the crack tip? So what do you use for stress? So what we did is we used the nominal stress ahead of the crack because we feel that represents basically the stress per uh, number of um, polymer chains. And um, instead of the um, singular stress, we replaced the stress by a stress at a critical distance RC. So everywhere we have stress, we basically have this um, crack tip stress parameter, which we calculate by FEM, simulating the experiment divided by the square root of RC. So that becomes uh, basically gamma over that square root of RC and the uh, activation energy become the fitting parameters. And this works pretty well. Those will show the fitting parameter and uh, I'll just show you what the result are. So the model prediction uh, from fitting that data is in the red and the experimental results are in the blue. And again, the plot is the, uh, sorry, there's one thing which I skipped over. We do another experiment, a sort of validation experiment in which we just simply stretch it at a constant rate until it breaks. And then we apply this kinetic model to that stretch experiment. And this is what we get. So it works well, a little bit less well at the highest stretch rate. Um, but it's hard to ascribe a lot of physical meaning to these, uh, these model parameters. But um, if you take that gamma over square root of RC, you can actually deduce a, a um, length scale out of that, which is in the order of nanometers. And if you turn that uh, energy into uh, uh, joules per mole, then it looks a lot like the activation energy you would see from many other polymers, which makes sense. This is a polymer after all. So this is basically representing the uh, energy of failure for those uh, polymer chains. 
Okay, so I know I went a little fast, but I'll just wrap up and uh, take some questions here. So just to wrap up, is this hydrogel with the dual network of crosslinks, permanent slash chemical and transit slash physical bonds uh, will let us go to large deformations, the forming and reform, failing and reforming of bonds gives us a highly viscoelastic uh, behavior. Uh, we have a self-healing property, at least until the permanent network fails at the permanent crosslinks effectively. And if we build a constitutive model incorporating the energy of breaking and reattachment, then that'll capture the rate dependent uh, behavior that we see in our tension and uh, rheometry test. And we can also use that model to uh, describe the effects of temperature either from the large deformation tension testing or from the small strain rheometry cyclic loading that we, that we use. Uh, and then we, the FEM implementation of this model is gonna let us probe the crack tip fields and um, develop a theory for tensile fracture based on the stress dependent bond breaking kinetics. So with that, I'll just kind of wrap up uh, this part of it and probably have lots of time for questions, I think. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, excellent experiments and uh, modeling. So we'll now open up for questions. Uh, I already I have a couple of questions. Uh, Rishab, uh, is he here? I wish to, uh, I wish to uh, Alan for an excellent yeah. talk. A very interesting talk. Thank you very much, Alan. I also similar. had a small question. Yeah, Sima, okay. please go ahead. Uh, I'm sure. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering whether these physical bonds, which you described so nicely, are they major players in the fracture process, or you also attribute the fracture strength to the chemical bonds? That is my question. Uh, sorry, I couldn't quite hear the question. S Sima, can you just type your question or? Can you please repeat it because it is your voice is garbled. Can you Even please repeat the question? question? I can repeat yeah. the question. Uh, yeah, question. yeah, voice is breaking. How yeah. Important, how important is the? Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Continue. Okay. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. We can hear you. How important, how important are the physical bonds in the fracture process compared to the chemical bonds? Yeah, OK. So the question was, how important are the physical bonds in the fracture process compared to the chemical bonds? Right. Yeah, right. That's, uh, that's a good question. Here's, you know, I'm going to speculate a little bit here. The physical bonds let you dissipate energy. So uh, in an actual uh, loading situation, the breaking and reforming of the physical bonds is your is an energy dissipation uh, mechanism. So that's going to show up. Like you, you notice, I don't have like a critical energy release rate type of approach here because all the energy, not all the energy, but most of the energy in any experiment is dissipated by the viscoelastic behavior, which is the physical bonds. In the end, though, to actually break the material into two pieces, you need to fail the the um, the chemical bonds, the permanent bonds. So we feel that those are the things which drive the final failure uh, at the crack tip. If you look at the asymptotic analysis of the crack tip fields, it'll show that what's important right at the tip of the crack is the part of the model, which uh, is the basically um, the, uh, the chemical crosslinks plus the fraction of physical crosslinks that are left. But the fraction of physical crosslinks that are left right going down to the crack tip. Um, you know, those have broken basically, but at those high stretches. So that's my best guess on that. I'm sorry, I don't have a more definitive answer for you. All right, uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, we have a couple of more questions. Uh, Rishab, uh, can you please unmute and ask your question, please? Is Rishab there? Hello, Rishab. Uh, Kaushik, can you please unmute Rishab? Yeah, I've just requested him. Uh, looks like he's not at the. Okay, Shamal, would you? Question? Yeah, Sh Shamal, would you like to ask? You had a question, Shamal. Yeah, yeah. 
Thank yeah, you. Please awesome. go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Professor, how do you speckle the hydrogel for your DIC? And uh, what is the resolution of displacement that you achieved in this, in, the, in your experiments? Yeah. The, the, uh, speckling the hydrogel for DIC uh, was a lot harder than we thought it would be. And in fact, we're working with a new hydrogel and our old method doesn't work. But I'll tell you what our old method was, is that we, um, we have an ink which is designed to go into acetate, so low surface energy material. And we spray it with an artist uh, airbrush at the very highest pressure and the very lowest kind of flow rate that we can get away with because you're basically painting on water. It's 90% water. So how do you paint on water? We want to get the ink to dry in the air while it's flying from the brush to the sample. And then it basically just kind of sticks on the surface. And if you just touch it with your hand, you'll destroy the pattern. So, um, so it works good enough. You have to be very careful with it. It's, we can actually do it in air or in oil. Of course, we can't put the, we can put it in oil. We can't put the ink on obviously when it's in oil. And then you asked about the displacement resolution. And that, uh, I, I, I'd have to look back at my student's thesis to tell you the um, displacement resolution. We did, you know, we're, we're dealing with fairly large strains, so we weren't so concerned with the really low strain resolution of this, but definitely, you know, and we looked a lot at the errors that are involved in everything. Okay. And we're definitely well below, you know, like a, about a tenth of a percent strain, tenth, tenth of a percent in terms of the strain error. Okay, Professor, if, if I may follow up on the uh, ink that you talked about, do you, yeah. uh, what kind of ink was that? Was like an organic ink or some sort of a, go, like a gold deposit? Like, no, uh, it's, so it's, can, can you... it's, um, it's just an ink you can buy at the store for artists. It's Kohenor uh, water-based acetate ink. Um, okay, okay. It's literally a black, black ink that you would put in a pen. Okay, but okay, all right, we, thank you. We found with the new gel we're working that it totally doesn't work and we had to use, we've gone to a gel that's solvent, it's basically an alcohol solvent based rather than water based. Okay, all right. It's okay, one of the hardest thanks. parts of the whole thing actually. We, like, yeah, we, yeah. Had, we, had, we had, had spent a whole sorry. summer working on that, one of the, like these undergraduate researchers and he tried every possible combination until he found something that worked. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you, professor. Thank you. Uh, Rishab, uh, you are back. You can ask your question. Please unmute. Uh, thank, thank you, Professor. Uh, sorry, I was uh, away from the mic. Uh, hello, Professor Zender. Uh, I have a question that how the wa how water is bonded with the other com compound in the hydrogel? Is it merely mixed with it or any other chemical processes are involved? Yeah, that's an uh, interesting question. So in the hydrogels, people talk about bound water where the there's basically hydrogen bonding be uh, between the water molecules and the polymer chains. Uh, and then the rest of the water is basically just absorbed in there and, and held. So um, the water is very mobile. You can, if you leave the gel out in the lab, it'll start drying pretty quickly. So it's not all that tightly bound um, to the gel. Okay, uh, I have a quick follow up to that. Uh, what will happen if we, uh heat this gel above the boiling point of water. Does the water remain, still remain bonded or it starts evaporating? Um, we've never tried it. I'm almost 100, 99.99% sure that the water will boil off. And I don't know, could there be some water that would remain high, uh, bonded to the gel? That, that may occur. Um, oh, okay. But, then, yeah, then that's, we didn't try that. <laughs> uh, thank you, Professor Zender. All right, uh, is there any other question for uh, Professor Zender? All right, uh, if there are no questions, let us thank uh, Professor Zender again. I mean, excellent talk, uh, very nice experiments. Thank you, Alan, for uh, yeah. agreeing to give a talk in the symposium. We're really pleased. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, thanks thank for the thank you. Good to see yeah. everybody. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, I'll stop my uh, sharing here. Yeah, yeah.